Hello, YouTube Sidekick here with another installment of an Iron Bomber's Guide to the DCS Galaxy. Today we're continuing our series on the last of the Iron Bombers. Uh, we're going to go out and continue flying the Harrier today, but before we do, uh, I want to take a quick look at some of the ordnance that the Harrier can carry. Uh, specifically, we're going to look at Iron Bombs and Cluster Bombs today. In a later episode, we'll take a look at the rockets and guns. Uh, after a little time at the whiteboard, We'll go out to the range, do a little practice with some Mark 83s and some Mark 20 rock eyes and see what they can do in DCS. So let's take a look at some of the Harrier's weapons. Uh, the first and most obvious of these are the iron bombs. And for a long time now, if we're talking iron bombs in the US and other Western nations, we're talking about the Mark 80 series bombs. They come in four flavors based on size. There's the Mark 81, 250 pound bomb that's basically been retired. The Mark 82 500 pound bomb, which is really one of the most commonly deployed weapons like ever. Uh, the Mark 83 1000 pound bomb, which is the largest that the Harrier can carry. And then there's the really big boy, the Mark 84 2000 pound bomb. These bombs have been around since the 1960s when the older models dating from World War II and Korea were replaced. They all have a very characteristic aerodynamic shape, and the basic shape was actually designed by Ed Heinemann, who was also the principal designer of the A4 Skyhawk. And he determined that the optimal ratio of length to diameter for iron bombs was about 8 to 1, giving the Mark 80 series their characteristic long, lean shape. Now, one thing to remember about these bombs is that in most of their variants, they are a fragmentation bomb. And that means that although, for instance, the Mark 82 weighs a little bit more than 500 pounds, actually, less than 200 pounds of that is high explosive. Almost 300 pounds of that is bomb casing. And it's actually the casing that does most of the damage when it is blown to fragments by the explosive charge. So really these bombs are not meant to blow stuff up as much as they are intended to tear things to shreds with high-velocity metal bits. This is important to remember when we discuss the lethal radius of the bombs because that radius is calculated on the lethality of the fragments to a human target that is above ground and directly in the path of the cloud of shrapnel. Based on that definition, the area effect of a Mark 82 bomb is about 30 meters long and 80 meters wide. Now, I could not find any sources for the lethal radius of the Mark 83, and I found one source that said the lethal radius of a Mark 84 was up to 360 meters. So I did a little math, and if we assume that that, that 360 meter number corresponds to the width number, then we get these kinds of numbers for the Mark 83 and the Mark 84, and they seem about right as they seem to scale well, just a little bit faster than the weight of the bomb. So let's, let's just assume that it's something like that. So why is the lethal distance so much shorter along the path of the bomb instead of sideways? I'm not sure, but I suspect uh, that it has at least something to do with fusing. You see, these bombs are normally fused to explode as the nose impacts the ground. But even with a very fast fuse and a very high explosive, that means that the bomb has penetrated at least some way into the ground when it explodes. And certainly its explosive force and the shrapnel cloud is directed downward along its direction of travel. Now, I have no idea if this effect is modeled in DCS, but the best I can say is that based on rough testing that I have done, it does seem that a Mark 82 bomb is pretty lethal to unprotected vehicles, at least up to around that 30 meter mark. When we get out to the range later on, we'll see um, just how effective a Mark 83 bomb is. Okay, so those are the iron bombs, uh, really kind of the basic bombs that the Harrier can deploy. Um, now let's talk about cluster bombs. The idea behind cluster bombs basically comes from the effect that we've just been discussing, and that is that a lot of the destructive power of a normal bomb is expended going effectively straight into the ground. Uh, this is great if you're trying to drop the bomb directly on something, but not so great if you're trying to neutralize an area around the bomb. So the concept of the cluster bomb started to develop in the 1960s. 
The idea of the cluster bomb that is instead of using high explosive to spray metal fragments around, the cluster bomb would instead be packed with a large number of submunitions or smaller bombs, which would be ejected at a height above the ta- target and which would then spread over a wide area and descend more slowly so that when they hit something, they put more of their energy into doing damage to whatever they hit. In particular, the submunitions are often mini shape charges. Uh, that are designed to defeat armor much more effectively than hot metal fragments from an iron bomb. For instance, the submunition in the Mark 20 Rock Eye uh, is capable of generating actually 250,000 pounds per square inch, um, and it can defeat armor up to about 190 millimeters. And given that the fact that they're designed to strike the top of armored vehicles where the armor is usually quite thin. This means that they may be able to do critical or even fatal damage to even modern main battle tanks. So the Mark 20 Rockeye was one of the first cluster bomb units, or CBUs, to be developed. It entered service in the late 1960s. It's been upgraded since, and it's actually now officially called either the CBU-99 or the CBU-100 in U.S. parlance, but uh, everybody just calls it the Rockeye. The Rockeye weighs about 500 pounds. Uh, and it can pretty much be carried by any aircraft that can carry a Mark 82 bomb. Each of the Rock Eye carriers carries 247 submunitions, and each of them weighs about a pound and a half. For what it's worth, in Operation Desert Storm, the U.S. Marine Corps dropped almost 16,000 Rock Eyes, and it's fair to assume that a good number of them were dropped by Harriers. Okay, so that's just a quick look at iron bombs and cluster bombs um, on the whiteboard. So let's go out to the range and let's uh, drop some of those and see at least in DCS what effect they have. Okay, so here we are out on the iron bomb test range. Let's assume it's around 1990. We're flying with some Mark 83s, same threats as we did the last uh, video. We're going to assume we have some point defense threats, so we're going to want to stay high after we drop the bombs. Okay, in the cockpit now we're getting fenced in, we've got our target designated, and we've got the uh, Mark 83s set up. Uh, as usual, we're going to drop them in pairs just to avoid having an asymmetric load. And we're going to uh, get ourselves trimmed out for our trim run over the target. Okay, while we're getting ourselves lined up, um, just take a minute to talk about uh, what we're going to do today. We're going to do probably three runs with the Mark 83s and then three or four runs with the Mark 20. So that's a lot of flying around in circles today. So I will probably uh, cut the video such that you don't have to watch all of that. But I do think it's important to uh, keep enough of the circuits in there to make the point that these are practice patterns that we're flying. Um, and I think it's important to do that because I think um, there's really no way to test the weapons if we're not testing them consistently, and, and the range practice patterns are a good way to do that. So, uh, sorry, we're going to have to fly around in circles a lot today, guys, but but that's kind of how uh, iron bombing works, at least when you're practicing. And as we talked about before, the only way to get good at it is to practice. So, we're going over the target, pulling up into our first pattern here. I'm not going to go all the way back out and reacquire the target um, every time I change it with the Mark 83s, at least. Um, feel like uh, that'll just take a bit more time than we need to take today so we'll, we'll keep the patterns nice and tight and um, we're basically going to drop the Mark 83s first on the, the unarmored vehicles and then in the second pass we'll drop them on the lightly armored vehicles and then finally we'll have a go at the main battle tanks. So here we are just about set up for our first run. And we just need to come across a little bit more. And we're about 15,000 feet, and we're rolling in. And we put the lift vector to the target, pull up. Now we got to try and time that rollout to roll out the flight path vector over the target, make sure we're near the ground mode. That's a good idea. And there we go. And we're at about a 40 degree dive. Got to pull up. Past the target and pickle, there we go. And pull up and away, and we uh, stayed well above, well, we stayed above 5,000 feet and pull up. How do we do? Nice. Well, as we probably should expect, 
with a uh, lethal radius of 70 meters on these bombs, uh, we pretty much annihilated everything around that 25 meter circle, though maybe should have even got a few that we did. So. Um, at least with lightly armored vehicles, a uh, thousand pound bomb is obviously bad news if it's anywhere. Okay, here we are at the top of the pattern again. This time we're going in for the lightly armored vehicles. So those are things like IFVs and some artillery pieces. And pull up a little bit tighter here. And we're rolling in. And once again, flight path vector to target. Went a little past at that time. Our lift vector to target. Now roll the flight path vector out. We overshot a little bit. Bring it back. Again, try and put the flight path vector beyond the target away so we're good and high when we pickle. And pickling at over 7,000 feet. Pulling up at almost uh, not that much below six. That was a good high drop. Okay, we hit the target. So with Mark 83s, looks like we got a bunch of vehicles that were within about 10 meters, but I'm not sure we got in, got all the ones that were within 25, even the lightly armored variety. So that says something about how DCS is treating the lethality of the Mark 83s. Got to get pretty close even to any kind of armored vehicle with a Mark 83. Maybe not right on top of it, but pretty close if you want to kill it. All right, so these are pretty steep dives. Um, from 15,000 feet, but that's why we're able to pull out fairly high. We're a little bit farther back this time. We're going for the main battle tanks this time. We're 15,000 feet again, but we're a little bit farther back. Maybe not going to be quite as steep a dive. We'll see how that affects our pull-up altitude. And we're just about there, inching a little bit more. And roll in, lift vector, roll to target. Pull down. Start to roll out, try and put that flight path vector right over the target as we roll out. A little bit early that time. Move it up, get it over, pull up, get a nice aim off mark, and pickle. And we're still pickle at six, higher than uh, almost 7,000 feet, I guess I'd say. See how we do. All right, right in the middle. And it looks like, looks like, well, we certainly got the Sherman in the middle. I'm not sure what we did to anything else. So, and maybe that's not unexpected. Mark 83 bombs are big bombs, but you're going to have to get pretty close to a main battle tank to do it a, a whole lot of damage. So, anyways, uh, that's it for the Mark 83s. I'm just going to turn around here. Maybe take a little pass by the target area. And then uh, we'll go back and uh, rearm with some Mark 20s. All right, there we are rolling in as we go past. We can take a look. Like I said, the first target pretty much obliterated. Second target, uh, we probably got about half the vehicles around that target. And on the third one, I think I only see one, one smoke plume. I think we just got the Sherman in the middle. Uh, yeah, I think so. All right, we'll off to get some Mark 20s. And so we're back with the Mark 20s. That was quick. And we're lined up on the first target again. Same drill. We're going to go over the target. Shallow dive, full power, make sure we're trimmed out. And we are, so let's pull up and go around. Now for the Mark 20s, I'm going to do the full drill going to go all the way back out each time when we change targets and reacquire the target and come back in. Uh, just for the practice, but also I have found when dropping Mark 20s that you have to be a little careful about the angle of dive when you drop. Um, now DCS doesn't seem to recognize any difference in the fuse settings. There, there are two different fuse settings you can pick in the Harrier. doesn't seem to matter which one you pick. Um, but it does seem to matter the angle at which you drop them. If you drop the rock eyes too steeply, they seem not to deploy high enough and they don't really, uh, you don't really get the submunition effect, I think. Um, so we're, gonna, we're a little bit farther out here, a little bit farther offshore. We won't have quite as steep a dive angle. The only thing is that may make it harder for us to pull up in time. 
but let's just take a quick look, see how we do. Lift vector to target. You can roll that flight path vector out. Yeah, only a little bit by that was pretty good. But now you see we're okay, so we're around probably by the time we pull up we're gonna be about 30 degrees instead of 40, 45. Now the trick is we gotta pull that flight path vector up, but we gotta make sure we don't get over the target until we actually get the cross on screen. The bar means we haven't got the cross on screen yet, so we gotta be careful. How far we pull it up, and there it is. And pickle. And there go our rock eyes. So let's see, see if we can get a picture of how they deploy here. There goes the deploy. And there goes the submunition. It wasn't really dramatic, but it did seem to do the job. I think we may have gotten just about every vehicle on that target. All right, so let's uh, pull around. And we'll have a go at the second target, which again is lightly armored vehicles. We'll see how we do with submissions uh, there. There's no question that that the rock eyes are just as effective as the Mark 83s were. So that's an interesting thing to note. On the soft skin vehicles, you might as well drop a rock eye as a, as a thousand pound. Okay. So now we're designating. We're selecting the second target designating as a target and selecting as T0 and now we just gotta get lined up and rolled in on it so we gotta pull a bit back to the right here so we can get it off the nose there okay there it is so once again we're coming in a little bit flatter in our dive than we did with the Mark 83's gotta keep coming across here pinch in just a little bit and there's the roll in and as ever lift vector to target pull up looking for the flight path vector we want to try and roll it out right on the target or in line with the target and it's a better roll up okay and again though we're even going to be less than 30 degrees this time let's see how we do Pull it up far enough to keep our drop height. And yeah, we're dropping fairly low. We're going to pull out lower than 5,000 because we didn't drop until 5,000. So that's an issue. Well, let's see how we do. Now that was impressive. We certainly got a number of those vehicles. So within a 25 meter radius, uh, we did some pretty significant damage there. Well, got at least three, three, maybe four, so maybe around the same as we did with the Mark 83 on the soft All right, so let's go out and we'll pick up the last target. So once again, we'll, we'll switch targets. Okay, so as we'll pull around, we'll pick up the last uh, target, which is waypoint four. There it is, waypoint four. We'll designate it as T0, and we're good to go. And as with last time, we just need, we need to bear off to the right just a bit to keep it where we want it. All right, so this is going to be the really interesting one because rock eyes are supposed to be effective against even main battle tanks. So let's see if DCS agrees with that assessment. Once again, we're going to be coming in fairly shallow which as we're finding out is an issue for how high we drop the bombs. And that's probably gonna be something we're gonna to need to think about if we end up having to drop these in a situation where we're actually have a defended location. Okay, looks like we're just about ready. Right about there. Roll the lift vector over to the target. A little bit by, pull it up. Try and pull out. Yeah, we're even even a little, maybe a little shallow. Now we're about the same. 30 degrees. Probably pull up to around 25. I'll make sure we get the cross on screen before we cross the target. Try and keep it 
lined up. Small changes. A little bit off there. Get it back in the middle. There we go. And pick. And let's see how we do. Well, looks like uh, we did manage to get at least a couple of tanks with that. Uh, the interesting thing is I'm not sure that I saw both bombs worth of submunitions. I saw one, but I'm not sure I saw both. Now the one that did land managed to take out a couple of tanks, so that shows that it's effective. It's not the... Once they're deployed they seem to be effective, but I'm not at all sure dropping them in a dive bombing attack like this that we're, we're getting consistent deployment of the submunitions. So, that may be the thing to take away from today is we need to do a little bit more work with the rock eyes to figure out at least uh, in DCS exactly how they can be used effectively. So we got one more load, so let's go around and see if we can pick off a few more of those tanks. So we'll come back in here again. Almost there. Pull it up. Tighten it up just a little bit. And we're a little bit higher this time, 17,000. Okay. Roll it in. Looking to get that lift or that flight path vector over the target as we roll out. Okay, so we're a little bit steeper dive this time because we're a little higher. So that'll be interesting to see whether or not that has any effect on the drop. Okay, we're lined up. We'll pass the target. Eh, not too much uh, deep, steeper, but... Alright, there we go. Pickled. And that wasn't very impressive. Hmm. Yeah, I would say I'm not convinced that the rock eyes are working exactly as I expected them to. Now, when they did deploy, they were quite effective, as effective as kind of uh, you would expect based on the way they're described, but but um, not sure that um, they're always deploying exactly as I would expect them to. So that may be something we need to do some extra work to figure out, at least in DCS, how it's treating the fusing and the deployment, because I'm not convinced. Uh, I've seen them work much better in, in shallower passes um, and although they're supposed to work just fine they were used this way in the Gulf War but I'm not sure that DCS likes using them that way so at any rate still a little bit more work to do on our rock eyes if you're enjoying these videos please do subscribe and for now this is going to be Sidekick signing off